and I feel like I need to come and visit this space because every time I see photos of it on Facebook, I'm like, it looks so cool. It's it's super cool. Like it's, I mean, it's so much bigger. The idea and practice of it is so much bigger than anything that I had originally conceived of or written down. And that has been a very, very cool process to watch that there's so much input from people that I didn't know that I would meet at the beginning of it, you know? So that's, that's been a very, very cool thing to see unfold. Cool. Well, let's start by having you tell us a little bit about, um, the story behind the make space. So where the idea came from and kind of what your, um, what your original vision and mission were behind the whole space. Um, about two, I'd say about two years ago, I started, uh, <laughs> I was walking down the street toward home and it was bulk pickup day in Harrisburg. And I passed by, I think like it was like an old dresser or something. And there were just all these old dresser drawers and I needed a, I, I was like on a time crunch for getting a birthday present for a friend. <laughs> and so I saw them and I was just like trying to figure out, I was also like super broke at this point in my life. I was unemployed and worked and looking for a job mm-hmm. and just didn't have a dollar. So I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do about this present. I'm going to probably, maybe I'll just like revert to doing a painting, probably need a can- canvas and then as I thought I need a canvas I saw this dresser drawer and I was like oh my gosh I'm just gonna use that dresser drawer and like paint it and make it into a shadow box yeah. so I did that and I'd never done anything like that before and it turned out passably well like you know I've, I've since <laughs> moved on from what that looks like but it, that was that was sort of the first instance of um sparking my interest in things like art and architectural salvage on a vocational level Um, Mm -hmm. because that had gone well and better than I was expecting it to. It was worth the experiment to see where that would take me. So I started getting into a lot of architectural salvage projects and then I started getting a little bit of a reputation for that kind of thing. Like I (laughs) I was living in this row home um, in a neighborhood that was being renovated and there was just like a a dumpster right outside my front door. So I would just routinely get into the dumpster and get out like windows and doors and things. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah. So then the construction people started calling me garbage lady and that was (laughs) reputation for a while and then I made friends with them and then um the developers who had been flipping those houses who had been contracting the wor- the workers to flip those houses found out about me and so called me into their office and they were like what's your deal what are you doing and I was like oh, oh I'm God. just doing art I'm just doing art with the, the things that you're taking out of your house and, and then they had interest in that they were like that's kind of a cool idea that you would be using architectural salvage it wasn't really something that um had it's not really something that's taken off um, full fledged in the area. Like there are certainly artists who um, who do that in the area, but it, there's not like a huge scene for that in Harrisburg. Right. Um, even even now, there is isn't really. So um, so then I started just booking art shows of architectural salvage. And I'm so sorry, this is like completely long winded. No, that's but cool. um, eventually. Okay, eventually I started hearing feedback from people saying like, man, it'd be cool, you know, it'd be cool to like have some larger items for this. And then that sort of put me into the context of, I don't really have a great space to be doing these projects out of, you know, I was working out of my bedroom and or the living room, which made me kind of a terrible roommate because I was just bringing (laughs) huge pieces of trash into the house. And, um, you know, it was, it was also undeal working environment for the work. You know, I was kind of limited by the space, by the, what supplies I could bring in. So, that was sort of where I started um, thinking about like, man, it'd be really great to have studio space, but I was in no position to afford a studio space. And then when I started researching where studio space was in Harrisburg, there's just like not a one, I couldn't find anything. Um, So anyway, so that was sort of in the back of my mind in the past two years. Then I had a job as the events director of the Midtown Scholar. And through that I met, Uh, I don't know, like 45 billion people. And some of those people were a small group of um, of actually people who were an outshoot of the Occupy movement. So all of these people who were encountering, um, I I wasn't actually a part of Occupy, but we scheduled a lot of events with them. And so I made friends with a lot of them. And there was this sort of 
working co-op group that had formed out of the Occupy, the larger Occupy group. And they had an interest in starting some sort of community space, maybe having to do with food, maybe having to do with art, but it was more that they wanted to have it be a community run um, entity. And that was really attractive to me. So I started attending those meetings for a really long time, like maybe, maybe like six months and it was like a monthly meeting. And, um, and so I learned a lot about the process of grassroots community organizations that way mm-hmm. from people who are, you know, who were in the practice of being very intentional with their ideology and the practice of um, how they were bringing things about. So that was really interesting. And then I, um, I sort of grew um, more specific in what I wanted to do. And so I sort of handpicked a couple people who I thought would be really integral to the process and invited them to essentially my backyard around my table with some whiskey and beer. And then we got a little bit more specific in the conversation about starting an art space. And um, so collectively we had about $20. So it really, (laughs) I'm exaggerating, but it really had to be something very intentionally low cost and um, accessible to a large number of people. So that was what framed how we were talking about what we wanted to do. Um, And we knew we wanted to start with the fundamentals, which was just space out of which to create. You know, if you're, if you're a creative person, you're going to be, I know you have this, but just like a, a huge basement full of boxes of supplies that you've just picked up over the years. And um, if you don't have a working studio, then that's, it's, there's a good chance that's just being unused or un, untapped. So um, yeah, so we knew what we wanted to do. And then we ultimately got this space, which uh, the space that I'm in right now, I'm going to flip you around so you can see this is actually my studio space, which is the converted. Oh, I'm going to go the other way, go in the other way, go in the <laughs> other way. <laughs> this is um, a bedroom, cool. originally a bedroom in a row home that we were able to uh, buy very cheaply from the, de- the same development company, WCI, who I had been um, <laughs> in their, I had been in their dumpsters, um, <laughs> getting out <laughs> doors and windows. So they knew me, they really liked the idea and the ethos of the project, and so it made it pretty affordable for us in trade for, it was a really crappy row home, like it had been used as an illegal kitchen um, and then those people had just like left in the middle of the night and so had left this house that was full of furniture and like exploded eggs and sriracha sauce and booze. Oh. And it just, it smelled and looked terrible. And that was one of the reasons why it was so affordable to us. <laughs> so we said, okay, we have no idea what we're doing. We're just going to say yes to this. And so we got the property on August 1st of this past year and, um, In the space of August 1st to September 22nd, I think, we uh, renovated it, not completely, but like to a passable level. And September 22nd is when we had our like inaugural gallery opening. That's when everybody um, came for the first time. So the function of the house is that we run, we converted the first floor into gallery space. Mm -hmm. And that also serves as venue space for. Uh, we have like a lot of DIY concerts and we have a a handful of classes and workshops that happen here Mm -hmm. and um, like writing workshops and photography workshops and collage workshops, et cetera. Um, And sometimes community groups meet here if they can't find a space, but primary, the primary function of this place is, is studio space for artists. There are seven artists here and we're all kind of on a spectrum of talents and interests. And, um, the that the house itself is an ongoing art project. Like it's it's passable now, and we have we have probably probably six hundred uh, visitors a month for various things. That's awesome. But it's yeah, it's insane. It's insane. So we have um, a really high foot traffic pattern through here. But all the time, we're just making it a little bit better. All the time, like there's. This is my porch out here, and there's just nothing special about it. There's a little bit of trash and some plants <laughs> and some, some jars. But um, my uh, local artist, Stephen Michael Haas, has agreed to – oh, no. This is becoming terrible. Anyway, so he's offered to um, do, like, an installation piece out there and just ongoingly make the house itself a, a work of art, which is oh, cool. very in line with – 
what I would have originally wanted. No, but that was awesome. That was that was a really interesting story. I love that it went from you like diving in dumpsters to I'm going to buy a building. And I still do that. And in fact, in many ways, that feels a lot more natural to me than what, <laughs> what I'm doing right now. Don't tell anyone. But um, <laughs> just kidding. You can tell everyone. That That is an interesting part of this process is mo- – all the time moving more toward an official capacity, both mm-hmm. as an individual and as an organization. Like we're on the path to becoming a 501c3 nonprofit now. And so that, that means things for how we operate and what we allow and, you know, all of those, all of those key critical questions. So it's very interesting. And I think all of us are still sort of imagining this as a giant experiment, just mm-hmm. seeing what we can do. <laughs> Yeah, that's so cool. Um, So do you have a vision for kind of how you're you're hoping for the space to grow and potentially from people that listen to this interview, what they could do to help support it? Oh, well. So (laughs) She's like, yeah, I have a long list. Here we go. Dude, I have like 45 things to tell you right now. So uh, (laughs) – That's a great question. Um, In terms of this specific space, so something we think about is the the container for something will will be a huge part of how you access it. So because because of the space that we acquired initially, this row home, Mm -hmm. we're providing something that is very specific to how this house is laid out. So you know, that's it's a collection of like seven bedrooms that are converted into studio space for artists. They're kind of small spaces and they're kind of limiting the kind of art that can happen out of here, which is really, really great for the community that's developing here. And like, you know, I'm learning a lot from these other artists, but it does mean that it's it's a specific genre of art that could survive out of this space and a specific number of programs that we can offer out of this space. So that's where we're, we're really helped by and limited by our, um, our uh, building. And so when we've been thinking about what's next, it, it's, it was fairly easy. Like it took a lot of work, but it was fairly easy to make this step happen. You know, it was a bunch of me and my riffraff gross friends and we converted a row home into studio space. Like that's kind of a no brainer. And so we're hoping, we're hoping that that will catch on in some ways and um, that that will become kind of best practice for the, for the region. It's a really affordable way and a really creative and community building way to find something like studio space. So yeah. we're hoping that other people will, will take that and, and run with it. Everybody steal this idea. Well, do I'll it. tell you, I'm, I'm very intrigued and inspired by it. So you might be able to push me over the edge. Uh, okay. All right. Let me know what you need. In terms of information. <laughs> in fact, that's actually my next point is now, uh, my interest is, so if you're thinking about like the timeline of, of a creative, project, whether or not that's like one project or like an entity, it, it has, there's, there's certain, uh, points along the timeline that need to be paid attention to. Like number one is research and consultation. So that was like me and my laptop for two years, whatever. didn't really know there wasn't like a, uh, an example to follow very much in the area. So it was just kind of like hunting and pecking and figuring out as I was going. Um, so that's, the primary step being research, that's really where I'm, I'm headed now is trying to find a way to bring quality resources to the creative sector in Harrisburg so that they can start things well and they can be situated well in Harrisburg. Because mm-hmm. my interest is in helping Harrisburg. And um, in fact, my primary interest is in community development before it's before art even. Yeah. Um, but this is a good tool to be bringing that about. Right. Um, so... Yeah. So next, next is, um, well, immediately next is, is market space, which is part of this incubation process, like trying to find a way to help independent artists and, um, entrepreneurs have a a place to actually get some money for what they're doing. So we're starting, uh, it's called the homegrown market and it's actually in, it's in a different building down the street from us. This is 1916 third street. And the homegrown market is starting this Saturday, guys, from oh. 10 to 5 every Saturday uh, at 1423 3rd Street. And it's right in sort of the walking business district of Midtown where, like, 
right down the street from Midtown Scholar and the Vietnamese Garden and right next to where Susquehanna Art Museum is. So okay. it's it's really well situated because if people are, if tourism is happening, that will likely land them in Midtown anyway. And so this is a great way for people from outside the city to come in and see what Harrisburg is making, the region, what the region is making. Um, but yeah, so that's next. Okay. And um in the future, who even knows? I mean, I'm I'm sort of terrified of making promises for things that might not um, happen just because I don't think, I don't know, my, my experience with this whole project is that it's been very necessary to go with the flow and take what's coming with a grain of salt and with um, creativity. So I'm much more interested in seeing what develops when I, I keep saying yes to things that make sense. And, um, it'll look different than I think it'll look anyway. So, uh, it makes me not want to do like a five year. Exactly. And if you, if you know what sort of person you want to be and you know what sort of like parameters are guiding you, I have this thing, uh, you can't really see it. It's kind of dark in the studio, but written on my wall is, uh, the American Association of museums had put out a standard of excellence and protocol, I think is what it was officially called. And then somebody, and that was just like super dry. So somebody translated that into plain English. And it's just, now it's like this really wonderful, succinct stack of advice on how to be good and proficient and ethical mm -hmm. and effective um, in different silos. So like, you know, in terms of fundraising or administration or education or maintenance, all these different all these different things you need to pay attention to if you're trying to nurture something. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing that I think about the most often in this whole process is I can plan a thousand different things and some of them will come to fruition and some of them won't. And as long as I'm not taking that as like symptoms of success or failure in like, you know, these huge over dramatic ways, <laughs> then I think I'll be fine. <laughs> right. So are you doing, is this like your full-time job right now or are you working somewhere else and trying to do this? So I, I am not working anywhere cool. else to try to do this, which is super cool. But the caveat is I'm a full-time volunteer and I am surviving on my, uh, my art now, which is, okay. um, I can do that because of how cheaply I live and I don't have a mortgage or a baby. So until I have those things, I can kind of gamble with <laughs> my income level. Right. Um, but I do cardboard portraiture primarily mm -hmm. and, um, I'm selling those on commission. You can see these at Liz Uh, but so that and other design projects, like a lot of poster design and uh, like book cover design, sort of project-based design is what I'm doing for um, for survival. Also, I forgot this piece of it. I'm also the administrator for Third on the Berg, which is Harrisburg's version of an open gallery uh, celebration. So it's a month, instead of the first Friday, like you have in lots of larger cities, we have third Friday so as not to compete with those people mm -hmm. and um and it's yeah so it's a monthly thing and so I do the marketing and promotion and administrative side of that okay. so that's that actually is also really what pays my bills <laughs> so have you found um that you're able to create more art now that you have more of the space or is it kind of well now you have the space but you have also added extra <laughs> responsibilities yeah I'm gonna go ahead and say both of those because uh, and on one level, art is how I make my living. So I definitely am making things uh, and designing things more than I had before opening the space. Okay. Um, what is situationally true about me right now is because of the administrative role I'm in and because this is all, again, sort of a crapshoot and it, it requires a lot of maintenance stuff that it, who even, like... <laughs> Who even knew mercantile licenses were a thing you needed? So you know <laughs> that portion of it takes up a lot of my uh, a lot of my brain power, and it's been all, it's been a while since I've had the time to sit down and like experiment with art making. Um, it's I'm mostly just doing things on a deadline on a commission, right. and I'm grateful that that is sustaining me, and um, it's also it's also meant. Um, that I'm functioning a little bit more as an administrator than an artist uh, most of the time. <laughs> right. Which well, is fine. I'm pleased. I'm pleased to be in this place in my life, but that is, that's an interesting thing that I wasn't totally counting on. <laughs> right. Um, 
you were were you an English major in college? I know you were an art major. I was not an art major. I am pretty completely self-taught. Uh, I was an English major, and okay. um, that made me really smart and really unemployable. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> but you know, a lot of people that would say that art majors are really unemployable. So have you been finding that that's true? No. Um, I mean, I've definitely... like an awesome business and, and you know, I obviously, I went into art education, so I was always planning on teaching. So that, that brings in money as well. But I yeah. then, I was just, I like to look what art jobs are out there anyway, just to even be yeah. advising my students. And the other day I was looking and there are like 5,000 positions for art directors and, I personally think that that field is just going to keep on growing because you can't automate creativity. Mm, that's um, such a great phrase. I've not ever been happier and I've not ever, like, even when, even, it, it's completely stressful, right? But it's stress that's, like, completely my own and in, in a function of what I want to be involved in. And I would be doing these things if it wasn't paying me anyway, you know? Right. So that's that's a good gauge and whether or not. Right. Would you be diving in right. dumpsters no matter what? <laughs> Yes. Yes, I would. And I would recommend that you do it too. Perfect. Let that be the takeaway of this whole thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so do you ever rent this space out for short term? So if somebody was thinking, I'd love to teach a workshop, but I don't have a space or mm -hmm. I want to do some kind of like fun photo shoot, can they contact you and say, Hey, can I hang out in your space for a day or? Absolutely. And that has happened uh, several times. We don't, this is something that we should probably do, but haven't yet. We, we haven't really gotten down like a menu of prices for that kind of thing. It's sort of on a case by case scenario. And, um, and so, yeah, that does, that does happen. Um, pretty, pretty like semi frequently. So definitely contact us and, um, we'll see if we can accommodate you. We had, um, we have had a lot of photo shoots that have happened here and, um, a lot of classes that have been taught out of this space and uh, a film was shot here, or I guess the pitch to a film was shot here this cool. past weekend, which was really cool. I was just like, I had no idea what it was going to look like. And then it was just explosions of cameras everywhere. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. you probably get to meet a lot of cool people through this space. Holy too. Moses. Yeah. So many people. <laughs> uh, so speaking of advice, what, I know we talked a little bit about some things you would say to people that wanted to start a space. So if they're thinking, you know, this sounds really awesome, or I do need a space to make my art and don't have anywhere to go. Um, cause I was one of those people, I was making art in our living room when we first got married. Um, and driving my, I mean, my husband was patient, but you know, he's coming <laughs> home and there's like paints all over the place oh, and absolutely. it was like, this is, you know, this is not working at all, Amber. Um, so I was pretty adamant when we moved, wherever we moved, there was going to be a room that was mine, um, which I still it's, kind of take over the whole house anyway, but it was worth a shot. It's been crucial for me to have a designated space mm -hmm. for work. I, I think it is. I think for any artist, if you really want to be serious about it, you need, you need to have a space where you can have your tools out. You can be mm -hmm. set up, um, instead mm -hmm. of totally having to like organize everything before you even start. Cause then you just yeah. don't ever start. Right. And you need sort of a place to let, to just leave a mess. Like if you yeah. can't, you know what I mean? Like something, something that's process based more than even just product based so that you can have those whatever, those amazing accidents that happen when you're not expecting to stumble into, like, a technique or a material. Right. You need the space to be able to experiment that way. Yeah, and I think you there, – there is something about an artist just being able to have their stuff out mm -hmm. around Definitely. them, not having to clean up every every time and just being able to walk in and out of the space and kind of keep, keep processing the piece that doesn't happen when yeah. it's on your living room floor. Yeah. And you had said something that was that really struck true to me about there really is a difference between an artist who's trying to express something, you know, using art as a tool of confession or expression or something, and a working artist, somebody who isn't a hobbyist anymore, somebody who needs like a professional a professional stance on how they are making and how they are marketing what they are doing, and that's that is that is part of the advice that I would give is really understand what you're trying to achieve by having space. Like if it's going to be small business artisans, um, 
then they'll require something that like, you know, a bunch of maybe a, bu- a bunch of high schoolers who want studio space that's going to look differently. So if somebody's interested in starting a space, um, understanding identity is super, super important to that. And um, having lots and lots of conversations with people who are smarter than you and who have done this before is also key. I did so much research and called so many people who didn't know me <laughs> and asking yeah. questions um, and, you know, also asked questions of people who knew me and um, who had tried this kind of thing before without success or with minimal success or with success and then just decided to leave it eventually. Um, just keep having conversations about it. That's a really, really key thing. And also don't try to do this alone. Like it's very, very important to have people that you can count on in order to, I mean, especially if it's going to be a community space, you're going to want to start involving the community immediately in the planning process. Um, did you figure out, uh, like, can you survive financially as a space if you don't have, Um, like if it was just the seven artists renting the studio spaces or do you need to have events happening there to also kind of help with the cost or are the events just extra money? We could, we could stop all the events now. The way that we're set up is we're, we're formally an LLC so that, you know, if something, if the house explodes, then it's not on, uh, us to really account for that legally. It's on the LLC. That's the safest and easiest way to form an entity. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, the way that it's set up is all of the artists uh, split the rent of the space. The rent, it's unbelievably cheap. It's 500 bucks a month and that includes the property tax. And so we're splitting it all down the middle. So it's 85 bucks a uh, a space for a month. Yeah. And we're all on a monthly lease. So, um, or rather, the LLC has rented out space to these artists on a monthly basis mm-hmm. and um, they can fire us. We can fire them at any point. I don't, I don't really see anyone moving out in a foreseeable future. Like if it's, it's a really affordable space and we, we've all put so much work into it that it's working. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah. So I, I'm hesitant to to say how to set it up for somebody else because it really will depend on what people are involved and what uh, opportunities you'll bump up against. Like, you know, maybe someone's grandma has this incredible house in the in the woods that isn't being used for anything. That's what I'm – I keep hoping my grandma has an incredible house in the woods that she's forgotten about. Um, but um, so I guess just primary advice would be – don't spend resources that you don't have. Like the way that we formed this space and renovated it, it was all on donation and sweat equity. Um, so we had a bunch of volunteers and then we just used whatever materials basically were around as often as possible. So it means that it looks a certain way. It looks a little bit scuzzy and it looks a little bit, um, alternative, I guess would be a kind way to say that, but that's part of the charm. And that's part of our identity too, is, is trying to not, not spend more than we were given or spend more than makes sense. Um, cause the point of it is to use creativity. So don't be afraid to use creativity. Cool. So if somebody wanted to visit the make space, um, Mm -hmm. are there hours that it's open or do they need to set up an appointment with you? Well, uh, we're not, we don't have open hours. We're, we're basically on an event schedule. And part of that is because, you know, wanting to, wanting to provide a little bit of integrity for the the fact that this is like studio space for artists primarily. Um, but we do have a a large number of events and you, if you go to our website, which is HBG as in Harrisburg, makespace.com, HBG makespace.com, we have an events tab and eventually maybe by today we'll have a classes tab and you'll be able to see what events are open to the public. And we're very, very active on Facebook. We do a lot of inviting on Facebook. So that's, if you like, like us there, you'll hear about a lot of things happening. Um, we have anywhere from four to six concerts a month and then um, other sort of ongoing things. We have a monthly collage workshop and a monthly, we're actually launching this tomorrow night, but it's a storytelling forum. Um, and that was, it's, it's 
a, a format that's pretty similar to The Moth, which is a really popular podcast out of New York. And it's essentially an open mic night. And instead of telling jokes or stories or tell, to, blah, 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 <laughs> instead of telling jokes or playing music, it's um, for storytelling. So you, oh, cool. all people have a five minute frame to tell a story. We have a panel of judges and the prize. And then the entry fee is either a monetary donation of like five bucks or um, a donation of books. And the program is to benefit uh, literacy programs through the Harrisburg School District. That's awesome. I know. It's really cool. <laughs> um, if you want to just come by and see the space, though, and I'm around, I'm always happy to give people tours. Um, it's hard to... It's hard to give um, definite examples of when I'm here because my schedule is just a little bit stringy. But just email me, and if I'm around and I'm available, I will happily give you a tour.